you know, think of your diet as an economic portfolio of nutrients. That's essentially what it is. Yeah. Yeah. If you diversify, then you don't have to micromanage. But the less you diversify, the more you have to micromanage and to compensate for that. So the diversification across animal and plant foods, across organ meats and muscle meats, across different types of plant food, all those axes of diversification are things that make the network of your diet more robust to errors, whether they're your mental errors or the physiological errors in your liver, whatever errors those are, that diversification makes your diet robust to them. So Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body, Mind, Empowerment podcast. I'm your host, Seamland, and our guest today is Chris Masterjohn. Chris has a PhD in nutritional sciences and is currently an independent researcher. He has a website, chrismasterjohnphd.com, where he creates content and courses about optimizing nutrition. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Sam. It's great to be here. Yeah, and uh, I've been looking forward to having a podcast with you after hearing some good uh, things from other researchers about you. So it's going to be good. Exciting talk, uh, but uh, maybe let's start off like what got you into the field of uh, nutritional sciences? Yeah, um, I, it really starts back when I was a teenager. I uh, My mother had fibromyalgia, which was keeping her in pain every night. And uh, often I didn't sleep when I was a teenager because she was moaning in pain and was in so much pain that it was keeping me up. And I watched her get into macrobiotics, yoga, tai chi, alternative medicine, herbs, and all kinds of things like that. And I don't know exactly what was the key ingredient, but she recovered dramatically to the point where she was no longer in pain every night. Um, and so that was an early experience that gave me a, an appreciation for the power of diet and nutrition and lifestyle. Um, although that kind of got me in trouble. So I started exploring a lot and, uh, my, for my own health. And that took me through the zone diet, which is a fairly higher protein diet, lowish carb, uh, not by today's standards though. Um, and then into veganism and as a vegan, my health really fell apart. So I thought I was getting into veganism to save the animals, to save the earth and to save my own health. Um, but what happened to my health at least was not at all what I was expecting. So my teeth fell apart. I went to the dentist and found out that I needed two root canals. I had over a dozen cavities. Mm. Um, my mental health fell apart. So I had anxiety disorders that began in my early teens, but in my teens, they were really just a nuisance. When I was vegan, they got 10 times worse to the point where they were really interfering with my life. So as an example of what a night might be, um, I, would, I would examine my foods expecting them to be poisoned or drugged. And I would just inspect the seals and not find any evidence of that and just keep inspecting it and inspecting it and inspecting it until I accidentally caused a tear in the seal or something that I would then convince myself had been there all along. Mm. And then I would throw the food across the room in anger, both because, um, because it was poisoned or drugged and also because I was angry at myself for not being able to eat anything. Mm. And uh, during that time, I don't even remember this very well. Like I do have vague memories of it, but I was talking to my mom recently and she said that there were like seven times where she brought me to the emergency room when I was in the peak of a panic attack. Mm. And I, I very vaguely remember one of those times. So I think even my memory was significantly impacted during that time. Mm. And there, there were a couple turning points in the story. So the, the, um, sort of intellectual turning point for me was finding out about the work of Weston Price. He was a, a dental researcher for what became the American Dental Association in the early part of the 20th century. And in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s, he became a pioneer of nutritional anthropology. He was trying to find out what, uh, how everyone in, in America, the nutrition was so bad at that time that everyone had tooth decay. So he was going out trying to find people who didn't have tooth decay. And he heard that there were populations that had not been exposed to modern foods who were fairly isolated in all different parts of the world who were immune to tooth decay. And so he went off to find them. And he wrote a book called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration with his findings. And the, 
there were two basic findings. And I think the first one is not that surprising to most of us. So one of his findings was everywhere across the globe, no matter what people were eating in their traditional diet, as they transitioned to what he called the displacing foods of modern commerce, which are white flour, white sugar, syrups, and canned goods, and white rice, um, their health fell apart. And it, he focused on their teeth because he was a dental researcher, but he also uh, elaborated on their health. And it was really everything that we would associate with chronic degenerative disease was what was popping up as people transitioned to those foods. So I think that today would not surprise anyone in, the, in the, any health community, right? Like right. vegans, paleo, uh, mainstream nutrition, pretty much everyone agrees that you shouldn't have much white flour, white sugar, and junk food in your diet. So that's not surprising. What was surprising to me reading this as a vegan was what the traditional diets were like, and not just what they were, but why they were that way. So Price put enormous emphasis on the fact that these people went out of their way to invest energy and time in procuring foods that were relatively difficult to obtain, but were so highly valued for their nutritional and health impact that they felt that they needed these foods to be healthy. Mm -hmm. And he specifically emphasized foods that were rich in fat-soluble vitamins. And he said that there were four categories of these foods, and not every group ate from all of the categories, but all of the groups put very strong emphasis on obtaining at least one, if not two or three of these categories. Mm -hmm. One was organ meats and egg yolks. So liver, heart, kidney, and other, other uh, organs besides the skeletal muscle that most of us omnivores eat. Um, organ meats and egg yolks, dairy products with the fat, the animal life of the sea, so fish and especially shellfish. Mm -hmm. And then the last category that most of us would uh, not want to eat would be uh, insects and other small animals like frogs, mm -hmm. where when you're eating those tiny animals, you are eating all the organs and whatever the either the exoskeleton or the bones or whatever they have in them and so i'm reading this and i'm thinking like first of all as a vegan i didn't really appreciate that valuable nutrition came from animal products so that's one but number two even when i was an omnivore i wasn't eating a lot of those foods i wasn't eating liver i wasn't eating heart i wasn't eating kidney kidney i wasn't eating insects i wasn't eating frogs yeah. and so i start i start I, i'm reading this and I, I really want to fix my teeth and so I, I start implementing the principles I learned from this book to fix my teeth, which worked. But as I began eating more organ meats, as I began eating more bones, as I began eating across the board more nutrient-dense animal foods, nutrient-dense in general, but especially the nutrient-dense animal foods, my mental health underwent a complete revolution without me even realizing it. And so the real, you know, reading that book, I said, was discovering Western Price's work was the intellectual turning point. The experiential turning point was when I was working in the dining hall as an undergraduate, and I see this guy pick up a stack of plates and take one of the plates from the middle of the stack to eat his food on. You have the guy a funny look inside my head, walk away, like, that guy's pretty weird. Why didn't you take the one on the top? And then a few seconds later, I suddenly realized that three months before that, I always, every single time I took a plate, I always took it from the middle of the stack because I was afraid of the one on the top. And I did things that were far more weird than that. Like I would spend 20 minutes looking for a glass that was clean enough to drink out of, out of all the clean glasses. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point that I realized that all the things that had plagued me mental health wise were now gone. And I didn't even notice them leave. So I still, to this day, I don't really know whether eating better in one minute led to uh, the complete resolution of all my mental health problems and it took me one minute to forget about them. Or was it a very gradual thing over those three months where I gradually was healed and I gradually forgot everything? All I know is that it was just, uh, you know, one day I was borderline crazy another day, not. <laughs> and so that was, that was really the, uh, the key thing that led me into this sphere professionally. Wow. Wow. That's a quite a long story and really fascinating to hear that. Uh, why do you, why do you think, uh, you failed the vegan diet? So to say, like a lot of people say that, yeah, it is physiologically, it is possible to do it, but uh, there's also like a lot of people who are, you know, not seeing success from it. 
Yeah, I think that um, I think that there's a lot. Of, there's a few things going on. So one is that there's uh, a number of nutrients that require metabolic conversions that are found in different forms in plant foods than in animal foods, and we need the forms that are found in animal foods to be in our bodies. We are animals, um, and and uh, they are in animal foods and not plant foods because um, animals require them. Right. Mm. And so there's a lot of genetic variation in the ability to make those metabolic conversions. And there is also, uh, a lot of things besides genetics that can have a powerful influence on your ability to make those metabolic conversions. So one example is vitamin A it's found as carotenoids in plant foods, and it's found as a substance called retinol in animal foods. And what we need in our bodies to not have vitamin A deficiency is retinol, not carotenoids, and we need to make that conversion. But there's a huge effect of genetics that are very, very common. There's a huge effect of thyroid hormones, other nutrients, digestive health, and other things, all that can conspire to make you a very good or a very bad converter. And so some people are just really good at getting vitamin A from plant foods. Other people are just really bad at getting vitamin A from plant foods. Vitamin B6 is another example where the same principle applies. Uh, the essential fatty acids, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are uh, another example where the exact same principle applies. And then there's a lot of things that are in animal foods that need to be in our bodies that are not considered essential nutrients, but are, they are, they're not considered essential nutrients because they're not essential to be in the diet because we can make them, they're physiologically essential, meaning they have to be in our bodies for us to be healthy. And some of these things are, even, are either found um, to a much greater degree in animal products and plant products, or they're just exclusively found in animal products. So think like carnitine, for example, mm -hmm. is exclusively found in animal products. You, you will die if you don't have carnitine in your body. Mm -hmm. You will die. Um, if you don't have enough carnitine in your body, you can have all kinds of problems. It could be energy problems, could be exercise intolerance, or it could be mental health problems. Uh, lots of different things could happen. And if you're not good at making the carnitine, and the, then suddenly you're dependent on the animal products to get that carnitine. And in, some, in a lot of cases, we don't have a very good data on the genetic variation out there. I would say the best data is for vitamin A. Um, but we all we always have two things. Um, usually we have hints, like we know that there are common variations in the gene that's responsible for converting vitamin B6 from the plant form to the animal form. We just don't have that much data on how prevalent they are and what, what you quantitatively, how much does that reduce your ability to get B6 from plant foods and things like that. Um, but what we always have is uh, is examples of very rare genetic defects in the ability to make those things. So pretty much every substance in the body that you can synthesize or every conversion that you can make, there's someone in the world that's been identified with a rare genetic defect for that thing that has disastrous consequences. And you can imagine that if there's a rare genetic defect in that that, that causes disastrous consequences, there's probably moderate genetic variations that don't cause disasters, but they just cause... They just contribute to variations in your nutritional needs. Mm -hmm. So I think in my case, you know, I haven't identified exactly what the thing is, but there's two things. Like, so first of all, uh, I think it's very clear that most people who go vegan don't have my exact experience. I think my experience is a lot more extreme than what even people who do experience negative effects of vegan diets get. Mm -hmm. um, and so I suspect that I have a pretty significant defect in synthesizing something that is is not very high in vegan diets that's not found in the multivitamins or b complexes or any other supplements i was taking at the time and that's really really high in organ meats like that's my that's my <laughs> suspicion um but we also know the second thing is that if you just look at the observational literature meaning literature where we just ask people what their problems are and what they're eating vegetarians and vegans have much higher rates of mental health problems. That's, that's indisputable. Every study that's been done basically has found that. And, um, you know, what's not clear is what the cause and effect situation is. So uh, you can imagine a number of things being true. There are, might be personality traits like perfectionism that cause people 
to go after more extreme diets and also make people more predisposed to mental health problems if they become too extreme. Um, but, but all, but I think there's a very powerful impact of nutrition because, um, because there are just so many nutrients that are harder to get from plant foods, especially if you're not good at making those metabolic conversions. And, um, Oh, another one I should have mentioned before is cholesterol. Like mm -hmm. Cholesterol is very demonized, mm -hmm. but there's at least one to 3% of the population that's not very good at making cholesterol and their cholesterol tends to be really, really, really low if they don't eat any. And that can be associated with pretty severe neurological problems because cholesterol is, um, you know, the brain is 2% of the bot of the body's weight and it's got 25% of its cholesterol. So cholesterol is massively important there. Crazy. Yeah, it's uh, really hard to pinpoint what the exact thing may be. And uh, I, f I think like it's not that the vegan diet itself is uh, like a deficient thing. It's just that most people already are somewhat nutrient deficient in some aspect or another or some in some nutrients. And it's really like once you even go vegan, then you exclude, you know, probably the more nutrient dense foods. And uh, yeah, it's kind of compiles it all together. So you, went, you, you, you even mentioned that, you know, regular people who are eating a, uh, like a standard diet, they already are deficient of, of many nutrients. So like if you go vegan, then you're already excluding, you know, the, yeah. the bare minimum as well. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. And I think that's not the entire picture, but it's part of it. So uh, a great example of that would be vitamin B12. You can actually store up to 30 years worth of vitamin B12 if you get a lot of it. Uh, the thing is, you can't really stock up on it by like just taking really high dose supplements. You take a high dose supplement, you absorb a day's worth from that supplement, and the rest just kind of goes out the other end. Right. Um, but if you're if you're always eating vitamin B twelve rich foods at every meal, and you know meat and dairy, which are very common among omnivores, are not they're good sources of B twelve, but they're not they're not superfoods like clams and liver are superfoods. Oysters are superfoods. Oysters, clams, and liver are, are B12 superfoods. And uh, if, if you were eating even small amounts of oysters, clams, or liver at every meal, you could stock up 30 years of vitamin B12. Mm. And so you could probably go vegan for decades before any problems happen or any problems even begin to happen. Um, but most of us aren't in that position and some of us are in worse positions than others and digestive disorders are a major factor in vitamin B12 absorption. So if you have someone with mediocre B12 intake who has, you know, subclinical gastritis that's hurting their absorption for the first 20 years of their life and then they go vegan, they just don't have much left over to stretch out along that space. Um, but the only reason that's significant, the only reason, um, is that the that there are nutrients that are harder to get on a vegan diet like if mm. if that would not matter if it were not true that there are nutrients that are harder to get on a vegan diet and um and so the you know the other thing is it's not um it's not about whether any diet is intrinsically nutrient deficient like that's not a good way to approach the question the issue is that the more you restrict the more restrictions you put on your diet away from what a, uh, you know, the most, like if you make the most, if you say, I don't care about ideology, I don't care about suffering. I don't care about the environment. All I care about is getting all my nutrients in mm -hmm. the diet that you would make. If that were your chief concern, just pack as many nutrients as you can from natural whole foods. Um, the more restrictions you put that make you deviate away from that diet, not saying this isn't a should or shouldn't issue. Um, this is just a factual issue. The more restrictions that you make that make you deviate from that uh, ideal of nutrient density, the less robust your diet is to errors, whether it is errors in your planning or whether it is errors in your physiology, right? So yeah. what, what, I think, what I think everyone in the vegan sphere emphasizes correctly is that a vegan diet has to be properly planned. And when people talk about, you know, so the, the position of the uh, American Dietetics Association is, you know, properly planned vegan diets can be healthy. Mm -hmm. Put that in there. Um, some, you know, some people might counter every diet has to be properly planned, but that's not really true. Um, 
it, most people would benefit from paying some attention to their diet. The more diverse your diet is, the less planning it requires because mm -hmm. uh, just for the, you know, the same reason with economics, right? Like if you're, you have a retirement account, you don't have to do anything with it. If you just tell a retirement agency, I want the average result that you get and just make me able to retire. Mm -hmm. But if you start saying, uh, oh, I want a self-managed plan, put it all in real estate, put it all in Bitcoin, or you say, oh, I'm just going to buy stocks myself, then all of a sudden you need to be an expert, right? right. So the same thing is true. You know, think of your diet as an economic portfolio of nutrients. That's essentially what it is. Yeah. Yeah. If you diversify, then you don't have to micromanage. But the less you diversify, the more you have to micromanage and to compensate for that. So um, to be vegan, like you can have a diverse or non-diverse vegan diet within veganism, but to be vegan is, is, is anti-diversification. To be carnivore is anti-diversification. To be paleo is anti-diversification. So to the extent you take, you go deviate from that diversity, you have proportionally to plan. So to say a vegan diet has to be properly planned is, an, is basically an admission that because it's vegan, you must engage in the right planning to compensate for the restrictions you put in. Mm -hmm. But what, what no one says when they talk about that is that you're not just trying to make it robust to errors in your planning. It's also becoming less robust to errors in your physiology, meaning in your ability to harness nutrients that you need, for example, from those plant foods. So. Um, Let's say half the people in the population are good converters of beta carotene, half the population are bad converters. Well, if you eat uh, four ounces of liver a week, you don't have to care if you're a good or bad converter mm -hmm. because whatever else you ate, you, meet, you met your basic needs for vitamin A from that four mm -hmm. ounces of liver. If you don't, and if you say, I'm going to get all my vitamin A from carrots and you eat a lot of carrots, suddenly now it matters whether you're a good converter or a bad converter. Um, so basically, so basically you're, you are losing insurance policies. Like yeah. the, the diversification across animal and plant foods, across organ meats and muscle meats, across different types of plant food, all those axes of diversification are things that make the network of your diet more robust to errors, whether they're your mental errors or the physiological errors in your liver, whatever errors those are, that diversification makes your diet robust to them. So vegan diet is not intrinsically deficient. It's just less robust to error. Right. Yeah, that, that's a really, a really good job in explaining it and uh, going into the detail with it. And uh, yeah, the same with the same principles or the same potential dangers apply too. Like you mentioned, the carnivore diet, or even like the keto diet and the paleo diet, so to say, because they are somewhat restrictive, and you have to really go out of your own way to pay attention yeah. to those potential deficiencies that that may yeah. occur. But yeah. uh, but but there's also the thing that you know there's the eighty twenty rule that uh, applies. Like you can get most of your nutrition or most of the nutrients you need from like a certain certain food groups and you you not necessarily need like a whole spectrum of all the different foods so to say if you get like most of your nutrients from like the really nutrient dense foods that you already mentioned such as like organ meats and clams and those sort of things yeah i mean you if if you do it right you could probably make it a 98 two rule right so <laughs> e. colin campbell says that uh this, this is one of, the, one of the big beefs I have philosophically with T. Colin Campbell wrote the China study, which is mm. one of the major uh, books in, in uh, vegan circles. So he says that the ideal amount of animal products is 2% or less of your diet. And it's a lot easier to just go vegan than to regulate yourself at 2% of your diet. Mm -hmm. And that's true. But think about what you can do with 2% of your diet. Like if you ate one clam, one oyster, and 10 grams of liver a day, you would, uh, or let's make it a half ounce of liver a day. Mm -hmm. uh, so one oyster, one, cl uh, one clam, and a half ounce of liver every day. You would be completely covering your needs for zinc, completely covering your needs for copper, completely covering your needs for vitamin B12, completely covering your needs for vitamin A, even if you're a bad converter. Mm -hmm. Um, there's just so much that you can do with so little if you're going to focus on those things. 
So, you know, another, another principle that we could kind of lay out is that uh, we might talk about a lot of foods that a lot of people don't want to eat, like liver and clams and oysters. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, you, you basically have to take the approach where you eat superfoods that give you more freedom in the rest of your diet or you have to be more strict with the rest of your diet. For example, um, there, you know, just even just even something like riboflavin, like the the richest food in riboflavin by far and away is liver, mm -hmm. and um, and then after that you're looking at heart and kidney and almonds, and then like mm -hmm. way below that you're looking at red meat, salmon, eggs, um, mushrooms, seaweed, couple plant foods. And then almost everything else is way below that, right? So if you eat liver and you eat heart and you eat kidney and you eat almonds, then, or you just pick a cup, one or two of those foods, um, in, then you can kind of ignore the rest of your diet. But if, if you're a vegan, you have so little access to foods in those top tiers that you basically can't eat any sugar or fat or added fat. Mm -hmm. um, not, yeah, not fat, but added fat can't add fat and add sugar to your diet at all, really, if you want to get enough riboflavin through the rest of those foods. So it's like, right. it's not that the, those bottom, it's not that the 90% of foods on the bottom don't have enough riboflavin. They do. It's just that you don't have any room to say like, oh, I want to enjoy a dessert that doesn't really have much nutrition once a day at the end of the day. Like that's, right. even that starts to become, um, displacing to the important nutrients in your diet yeah you would like you would have to eat too many calories to reach that uh limit so. right right yeah you i mean you either if you want to if you want to get all your nutrients in without exceeding your calorie requirements you need to either eat um enough superfoods and then have a lot of freedom in your diet or you need to be really really strict about sugar and fat mm -hmm. right yeah, yeah that's true uh what 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 would be like the most common nutrition deficiencies like everyone can expect or look out for uh, besides just a, a vegan diet? Yeah, I um I don't know if this is that useful of a question. So um, I mean, it's a sensible one, but I don't I don't know if if the answer to it is is really where we want to be going down. So mm. if um if, if you look the the thing is like if you look at um at data from the National Health and Examination, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES, uh, they do these things like anal analyze like what are the nutrients of concern, and they look at things like what proportion of the population is not eating enough of each nutrient. And they come out with ones that are more common than other ones. Um, but, quite often what those surveys show are contradicted by data on biochemical indices of nutritional status. So for example, I just mentioned riboflavin and riboflavin is not listed as a nutrient of concern because the survey data indicate that almost everyone hit either hits the RDA or gets close enough to the, uh, to the RDA for riboflavin that basically like very few people are deficient in it. Mm -hmm. But there was a study in Britain where they just took a random sample of people that reflected the, the population in general. And they looked at their, at biochemical markers of their riboflavin status. And like 45% of the adults came up as deficient and 75% of the teenagers came up as deficient. Mm -hmm. And so you look, you look at that and you're like, well, what if you had that data for all the other nutrients that might really overturn your sense of what's probable. Um, so I, I prefer to take a much more individualized approach, uh, both, you know, on an, in, on an individual level, I think the proper way to assess your nutritional status isn't really to think about probability terms with the general population it's really to think about what um what are the indicators in me so if you have a lot of money you can do a lot of fancy testing if you don't have a lot of money you can do a dietary analysis with an app like chronometer um, you can do uh you can go through this all your signs and symptoms 
and um and actually this is kind of hard to do, but I have a resource where I have compiled all the signs and symptoms of nutritional deficiencies. Um, so if you have something like that, you can look, you know, kind of check off the boxes of which ones apply to you and that can all point you in the right direction. Um, I do think it's also useful to think about it in terms of dietary patterns. So, you know, the other, the other thing is like in the general population, um, the average person's 60% of their diet is, is white flour and almost, you know, very, probably very few people who are watching your show fall into that category. Mm -hmm. And so mo like most people who are watching a health show are in any one of many um, non mainstream dietary communities where they're effectively in a completely different population. And so it's particularly useless to them to talk about what's most common in the general population because none of them in any of those, like no vegans, no paleo, no, um, you know, you pick your carnivore, just pick your keto, like whatever it is, mm -hmm. just pick your diet. None of those people are eating 60% of their diet as white right. flour. Um, and so the nutrient, the nutritional profile suddenly is very specific to what dietary trend you have adopted. Um, so you can talk about vegan, you can say like, what are the primary things that you would think of different there or paleo? What are the concerns you'd have there or keto? What are the concerns you'd have there? I think that's a, a helpful way to look at it, but I think a general average isn't that helpful. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah, that is very context specific and yeah. it's varies between the different diets and also like the genetics play a huge role and your dietary habits and taste preferences, I would also imagine are going to yeah. affect a, a whole lot of it. Uh, but um, what would be what would be like maybe some of the specific nutrients to pay more attention to in the sense that uh, something that are more important like vitamin D for instance or what 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 were the nutrients that Weston A. Price really highlighted in his studies? Yeah, so Weston Price um, he was really big on the fat soluble vitamins, although he, when he was writing he didn't even know about vitamin K. And so he was real focused on vitamin A, vitamin D, and vitamin E. Um, I think that nowadays the, the picture is a little bit different. The, the general, I mean, first of all, we know a lot more about the nutrients than Price did in his day. Second of all, the picture of what people are eating is, is very different. So um, with, look, with vitamin D, the, the main pattern that you have to be concerned about is indoor living. So we get vitamin D from the sun. Um, a lot of us don't spend much time in the sun at all, and that's probably the overwhelmingly biggest factor that could make us nutrient deficient. Mm -hmm. And um, that's you know that varies with how far you are away from the equator and things like that. Um, and it also varies with your skin color too. So the darker your skin is, the more time it takes for you to get enough vitamin D. Um, and there's kind of a tension between how much time do you have and how much skin do you expose? So, um, back in the, back in the day when the, the idea that we weren't getting enough vitamin D wasn't very popular, they used to say, you can just go out with, for a few minutes with your hands and face exposed. Now that a lot of people are thinking that a lot of us need a lot more vitamin D, you really have to appreciate that, um, when you go outside you're standing up and if the sun's directly overhead, your the top of your head is what's really facing the sun. It's covered in hair. Mm -hmm. If you want to, I mean, you, if you want to get maximal vitamin D, you take off all your clothes and you lay down and then you flip sides, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like sunbathing really is yeah. how you would dramatically increase your vitamin D. And so you kind of have to measure it against like, do you have, enough uh for i mean first of all what's your skin color so for someone like me or you it, it might not take more than like 10 or 20 minutes of decent sun exposure to maximize our synthesis on a certain area of skin mm -hmm. um but if your skin is darker and it takes you 30 minutes and you don't spend 30 minutes outside then you'd probably be way more um in but much better shape if you spend five minutes sunbathing in a bathing suit uh, two and a half minutes on each side mm -hmm. than if you spend 10 minutes walking outdoors with your, with your hands and face exposed. And, um, and if you're at a temperate latitude, like you're not close to the equator, then, uh, there's a huge seasonal effect so that 
in the summer, um, you know, like in the Northern United States, you can get a lot of vitamin D in the summer, most of the day long, but in the other seasons, it really matters that the closer you are to noon, the more likely you're going to get, uh, enough vitamin D from that. Uh, so those are, those are concerns there. Um, but if we start looking at these dietary patterns and we start to see, um, we start to see some, some things that stick out with each one. So like with veganism, I mentioned vitamin A, I mentioned the things that, uh, we need to synthesize like cholesterol and carnitine and things like that. And the other nutrients that require metabolic conversions are vitamin B6 and essential fatty acids. So those are the main concerns there. If we look at, um, if we look at carnivore, we're looking at things like vitamin C, manganese. Those are probably the, um, two important ones. And, um, if we look at paleo or, um, paleo, I, you know, I think it, it kind of depends on how you, on how you do it. Um, but probably calcium would be a big one because, people are generally not eating dairy and you definitely can get enough calcium from non-dairy foods. It's just, that's the one that's going to require the, the most of the proper planning on the paleo side. And actually that would apply just as well to veganism as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but there's, there's, I mean, there's, there's so much to say about each particular one. So it's kind of its own can of worms to open up. Yeah, for sure. That's that's true, uh, and yeah, I would I would imagine like a lot of people who are doing a paleo diet, they they do have like at least most of the nutrients are still covered in a sense that uh, that they mimics a lot of these similar eating uh, habits or similar food groups that hunt together as you eat in the past as well. So like different. Yeah, of it, well, it it has the benefit in that it's it's not that undiversified mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the foods that are cut out are some of the least valuable. But um, I mean, so for example, like if I had to cut out a carbohydrate food, I think grains would be the, the first one I'd cut out mm -hmm. because their nutritional profile is not very diverse compared to other starches. So potatoes and, and legumes, for example, are much more nutritionally balanced than grains are. Mm -hmm. A lot of paleo people don't eat pale, uh, potatoes or legumes, though. And um, I think one thing that could come up for a lot of people on paleo is that if you're eating a lot of meat, then you're getting a lot of sulfur amino acids, and that raises your need for molybdenum, which is a mineral that is found most abundantly in legumes. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have enough molybdenum, it's harder for you to handle the sulfur load and you can get sulfite accumulating. And that sulfite can cause, in some people it can cause reactions that kind of seem like allergies. So like mm -hmm. some people who can't tolerate wine, for example, or um, dried fruit and things like that, it's because sulfite is added to those as a preservative. And, um, but it's made in our own metabolism from meat. And so if you don't have enough molybdenum, um, and basically, a, a, basically a, a, a dietary pattern of high meat, low legumes is the pattern you'd expect to lead to sulfite accumulation. And that is, that is very much the paleo diet. Okay. Um, so, so like a, someone doing a carnivore diet should also eat some beans or <laughs> well, a car so a carnivore can eat beans. And, <laughs> and so that's that, um, you know, what can you do about that? Well, I think you can, so, I mean, carnivore is pretty hard to navigate um, nutritionally. It's just, it's just very hard to navigate. So like uh, you could say, well, you know, if you can't eat beans, you want to eat less meat. But if you eat less meat, what are you eating more of a carnivore diet? Fat. Mm -hmm. um, that's eating a diet that is mostly fat is a huge nutritional risk because there's just not a lot of vitamins and minerals in fat. Mm -hmm. There are certain fats that are, decent in fat soluble vitamins but there are no fats that are decent in water soluble vitamins which is most of the vitamins mm -hmm. and uh and, and minerals generally are not found in fat mm -hmm. so one of the things that like on carnivore one of the things that can be kind of surprising is actually if you're eating mostly meat there's a lot of nutrients where you would not expect meat to be a good source of it and yet you're eating so much meat that all of a sudden it adds up. Right. 
So you, there's a little vitamin C in meat, for example, and you're not going to hit the RDA on a carnivore diet. But if you eat 2,000 calories of fresh steak that's not overcooked or it's raw, you're getting a significant amount of vitamin C that could probably hold you, you know, if, if you didn't go into it with scurvy, mm -hmm. um, you know, to reference your point from earlier, uh, you could probably go years and years before you develop scurvy on a, on a carnivore diet because of that small amount of vitamin C. Well, that's not true if you start restricting the meat and eat mostly fat. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I'm, you know, if I'm in that situation, I think when people go carnivore, the, the, the people who are good candidates for carnivore diets are people who have uh, really bad intolerances to things found in plant foods and probably to multiple things found in plant foods. Mm -hmm. um, you know, be, like if you don't tolerate uh, oxalates or something like that, there's an easier way than carnivore to take care of that. Um, mm. So I think these are people who just have broad intolerances to plant foods and they're finding, um, you know, and whatever those intolerances were, they were so bad that just fixing that problem has such a positive, you were talking about the 80-20 rule. Well, mm. if this one thing causes you such a big payoff, then at least for now, the other ways in which it causes smaller problems don't matter. Um, you know, you look at what's, what's the one thing I can do to get the biggest payoff and cause the least problems. And the fact that that diet might give you scurvy in 10 years is not one of your biggest problems right now. Right. The fact that your autoimmune condition cleared up is one of your mm. biggest problems is, is the biggest problem you solve. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people are on carnivore diets where if they have some more sulfite accumulating, um, they just they don't know its problems from it because they just fix problems that are so much bigger. Mm -hmm. I think the thing is, you, you so there, I think there's two really important principles to nutrition, and we mentioned one before, which is individual variability. So we could state that principle as your needs are not mine, mine are not yours. Each person in the audience who's watching this, uh, yours are different than both of ours. And so that's one principle. The second principle is that my needs are not now what they were 10 years ago and your needs are not now what they will be in 10 years. So our needs change over time. And I think you have to be really, um, I think it's, it's very easy when you get some success in something to generalize, not just to, I, I think we're, we're, we tend to be a little bit more conscious I mean, we actually tend to not be conscious enough about this, but, but to the extent we get conscious of one of these two, we tend to, to first develop consciousness of the fact that we overgeneralize from ourselves to other people. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's easier to see that because we, you know, we can just say like, oh, I went vegan and I feel so much better. And then someone on Twitter says like, my teeth fell apart. <laughs> and you're like, oh, really? Maybe it doesn't apply to everyone. Yeah. It's way harder and way more slow to come to the appreciation of how your needs change over time. And so when you get that initial success that makes you want to generalize to other people and to yourself, um, you, you generalize to yourself and it creates huge problems mm -hmm. because you get stuck in a rut. You just record this experience as a positive one and then you're anchored to that. So if you develop problems in the future, you're way more likely to say, oh, I remember when doing this fixed this thing for me, I'm going to go back to where I came from on that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that might not be, the, that might not be the, what you need at that yeah. point. Yeah. And um, so the example that we were just talking about is, uh, you know, in 10 years on a carnivore diet, you might develop scurvy and that might become your biggest problem. Whereas the autoimmune condition that went away 10 years ago wasn't. Mm -hmm. Um, but to take a totally different example, and I think this is a really powerful one. Imagine a woman who has the genes for hemochromatosis, which is a condition of iron overload. Mm -hmm. And imagine that through, uh, through 20 or 30 years, she has a heavy menstrual flow and she has a tendency to anemia because she's losing iron in the blood that she loses when she menstruates. Mm -hmm that woman could go decades completely hidden from the predisposition to iron overload and develop a repeated experience of feeling much better when she starts to feel run down mm -hmm. by eating more red meat, 
maybe by eating liver, by taking iron supplements or doing whatever she needs to get her iron back up. She could have that experience so many times that it could be constantly reinforced. And then if she hits menopause or if she goes on birth control or if she develops amenorrhea from exercising too much and under eating or whatever it is that suddenly cuts off that predisposition to anemia from heavy menstrual flow, after a certain number of years, she might start to feel run down the same way. Mm -hmm. But this time it's because iron's accumulating too much. But her instinct is, oh, I remember the last yeah. 17 times this happened. I'm going to double down on iron. Yeah. It gets worse. She says, oh, I'm not doubling down. I'm going to triple down on the iron. It gets worse. Mm. And then over time, maybe she runs some tests and finally finds that, oh, actually, it's a reverse course now. But um, you don't have to adopt a trendy diet for that principle that your needs will change over time to apply to you. Yeah. Yeah, it's like people tend to really attach to specific ways of doing things, uh, especially, especially in diet. Like they, they go on this really restrictive diet and they see immediate results and they feel amazing. Uh, but after a while, their needs and uh, their, their metabolic conditions or requirements change as well. So that diet is not going to be suitable for them anymore. And they're going to have like right. sub suboptimal uh, uh, results. And then they're going to, you know, rationalize it the way that okay, it's just like maybe temporary or something. I just have to push through or something. But what the, the real answer would be, you have to change your approach and adopt like a new new uh, way of doing it. Uh, but, you know, I, I think like for me, the definition of like optimal nutrition would take that into context as well. That optimal nutrition is eating the right things in the right amounts at the right time. So mm. that, defini yeah. that, that, that definition itself is like uh, malleable and it's always changing all the time. So it's never really like really specific it's like context dependent yeah yeah that's that's so true uh but what about are there any like benefits to um nutrient deficiencies so to say that um you know the, the it, it's not always like a very good idea to maybe have like a bunch of uh nutrients available all the time maybe it's sometimes you very good to have these periods where you don't get those nutrients so your body will become more sensitive towards them and uh even like the phytonutrients from certain foods, they may have like a beneficial effect on your health and uh, longevity as well, like some uh, polyphenols, et cetera. Um, what, what are you saying about the polyphenols in your last point? Are you, are you asking whether it is good to abstain from them periodically? Uh, is that what you meant? Uh, well, well like, the horm like the hormetic effect, so to say, that uh, they're not inherently... Uh, you know, useful for the body, but they activate certain pathways in the body that, you know, has a beneficial effect, like antioxidant uh, system. So. Well, yeah. So, so the, um, those phytonutrients are the toxins that we are evolved to handling. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it, you know, if you look at, <coughs> if you look, if you look at, um, how they typically get metabolized by the body, maybe we absorb 1% of them because our, intent, our intestines invest a lot of energy in not absorbing them. And then what we do is metabolize first by the intestine and then especially by the liver, uh, just as if it was aspirin or benzene, some foreign substance that our body recognizes a foreign substance and needs to get rid of. And so if you drink a cup of green tea and then you look at someone's blood, everything, all of the compounds like EGCG, for example, that we think are the, are the active components of green tea that are health promoting. You look at those circulating in the blood and they are circulating as the forms that have gone through the liver's detoxification system. Mm -hmm. They're not the forms that, were, that you drink in the green tea. And what, what the liver does is it tags them to make them easier to excrete. And if you look 24 hours later, uh, they're all gone. And that's completely different from a nutrient. So a nutrient, the intestine tries to accumulate it mm -hmm. and then the liver tries to store it or put it somewhere and you know you eat a molecule of folate 200 days later it's still wherever whatever cell it entered in when it first came in and uh that's you know that's a completely different profile and if you take these things and you dump you know you can ask the question what would happen if we drank a cup of green tea and our body didn't treat those health promoting phytochemicals as if they were toxic what would probably happen is we'd die. Uh, I don't know if we'd die from one cup of green tea, but if you, if you just take those, uh, those chemicals are called catechins, the ones in green tea. Mm -hmm. If you just take those and you dump them on cells, 
at a certain, what you see is at a very low concentration that corresponds to what circulates in our blood, they increase the defenses of those cells against toxins. Mm -hmm. That has a positive effect on our ability to handle everything else. But if you increase the, the concentration beyond what you get circulating in your blood after you drink some, mm -hmm. uh, you kill the cell. Mm -hmm. And, you, and, and the, the principle is fairly simple. Those things are toxic. Our bodies spend hundreds of millions of years cohabitating on Earth with the diversity of the thousands of plant toxins. And our, the whole reason we have a detoxification system in the first place is not because our bodies accurately predicted that we would invent plastic. It's not because our bodies accurately predicted that we would spray Roundup on crops. Mm -hmm. It's because for hundreds of millions of years, we coexisted with this fundamental fact of life, which is that the only way to eat nutrients is to eat toxins. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, we have that because by nature, hunting and foraging for food means eating toxic things. And we must do that to get calories. We must do it to get protein. We must do it to get vitamins, minerals, everything that we need. We must eat toxins. Now, because those things are so old, our bodies are very well revved up to handle them. And then something like gasoline comes on the scene. And now we have these new chemicals. Mm -hmm. And those new chemicals, the reason that we think of them as toxic instead of thinking of them as health promoting is because our bodies are not evolved to recognize them as well. And so because our, our detoxification system doesn't recognize them as well as it recognizes the plant toxins, then its response is not to upregulate its defenses as much. And the ratio of toxicity to upregulated defenses is a lot higher. We can actually protect ourselves by eating the plant compounds because we do recognize them as toxins. Wow. We increase our defense to everything. And then if we're exposed to the benzene that's in gasoline, we can handle that now mm. because we, th we thought we were making more defenses against the plants, right. but now we use them against the benzene, right? Like, yeah. it's, like if, uh, it's like if we made a giant military force because we were afraid of Hitler, and then it's just sitting there, and then you know, some other terrorist cell comes on the scene that we need defenses against. Um, you know, suddenly you got a bunch of yeah. tanks. <laughs> you, can, yeah. you can be like, wow, I can do something else with this tank. Yeah. Um, it's like building, so, up, building up your stress resiliency against everything. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, that you, it's that you don't, um, you're, to some degree you have stress-specific responses, but they're never so specific that they don't generalize. And mm -hmm. many, many of them generalize very, very broadly. And so, yeah, you want, you want the, t but, but it's a case by case basis, right? Like it, mm -hmm. the, the principle of hormesis is that a little bit of something bad is good for you, but not every, not everything that's toxic is hormetic. And yeah. right? so, the, it, so yeah, some sure. things are hormetic. Those are the things that have a higher ratio of upregulating our defenses to um, toxicity. There are other things like, for example, cigarette smoking. Cigarette mm -hmm. smoking is hormetic. Cigarette smoking makes you make more glutathione, which is a very powerful antioxidant. Mm. But no one has ever been able to, to show a defined dose of cigarette smoking that's good for you. Right. right? So it's, it's hormetic, um, but it's more toxic than it is hormetic. Yeah. And so there's not really any good dose of cigarette smoking. Yeah, you, Whereas, can, you can get the, like a similar, similar response from something less toxic. You can get a better response from yeah. something less toxic. And the, the reality is that, you know, anecdotes about carnivore aside, uh, the, the data on the general population suggests that the more fruits and vegetables people eat, the better their health is. And there's no obvious limit to that. Um, so it's just a totally different situation with cigarettes where it's extremely hard to find the dose of cigarettes that's good for you if it exists. It's hard to find the dose of fruits and vegetables that becomes intrinsically harmful if it exists. Yeah. Yeah, it's again really context, context, context specific. Uh, but would, would fasting also, you know, fall into the same uh, category? So fasting, I, I think, is... Um, there are some things about fasting and about exercise 
that I think would be controversial whether you would call them hormesis, but do definitely have a lot of parallels. And I actually think it's, I actually think it's really helpful to think about fasting and exercise um, in this, particularly exercise in this context, if as an analogy, if nothing else. So mm. when you exercise, you're in an energetic deficit and your body says, geez, I need to be able to burn more energy and I need to be able to burn it more cleanly. Mm. And so you start making more mitochondria, you start making more antioxidant defenses because when you burn energy, you generate oxidants. So making more antioxidant defenses helps you burn the energy more clear, more cleanly. And, um, you know, I think that's a, that's, um, I think you you could see that as, as a hormetic response. I think fasting would do something um, not 100% as much, but fasting also creates a caloric deficit. And so it's, um, there are a lot of parallels to what exercise does there. Mm. But I think the, the dominant way that you should see fasting is not really as hormesis. I think it's really going through um, a cycle of phases of cleanup and repair. So your body in fasting conditions, you optimize for the things that you're able to do when resources are tight. Mm -hmm. And that means that you can engage in more autophagy, which is uh, breaking down things that are either not useful or harmful or inefficient mm -hmm. so that you can use them for fuel um, and then when you have fuel coming in, you make investments in long-term uh, long repair and rejuvenation and rebuilding. And so um, if you don't cycle through both those phases, you wind up with problems because if you're always repairing and rebuilding and never cleaning house, you just wind up with a big mess. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're always cleaning house and you're never building up and repairing and making investments then uh, you're going to waste away. And I think this, I think this is a, economics is very frequently a very good analogy for, um, for what's happening in the body. But I think, I, think, I think a great analogy here is economics, right? So when times are tight, you, you start to think about your budget and you start to think like, do I really need to be spending money on this thing? And you might also clean out your closet, right? You have limited space in your house and your closet like, some people's closets are highly organized, but mine, I don't know about yours. My, my closet is usually a mess. And so if t times are tight, you might say like, oh, I don't wear this shirt. I'm going to sell it. Mm -hmm. That will free up space in my closet. It'll, it'll turn over the resources. I'll get a little bit more money. I can put that money into savings um, to protect myself, or I can sell 10 shirts that I don't want to buy one shirt that I really like. And you start economizing and making space. and then when times are not so tight, you start buying things that you like better to put it in your closet. But now you're not overloading your closet. You're, everything's nice and neat because you've cleaned so much of it out mm -hmm. that when you put things you really like in there, um, now your closet's beautiful. It's easy, to, it's easy to find things and so on and so forth. Uh, for people who are entrepreneurs, I think it's an even better, uh, I shouldn't say better, but it's much more of a critical. It, um, in business, I think, this is true in a way that is much more critical that approaches how critical it is in the body. So mm -hmm. when, um, like in startup land, when money is easy, you get a bunch of startups that like really people start companies. It's not even based on merit really, because they're so easy to get money. They just come up with some stupid idea and you make a good pitch for it mm -hmm. and people throw the money at you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you wind up with, you wind up with lots of businesses that, some of them should just die at some point. But then within a business, um, you also get careless. You're like, oh, we can hire 50 people. Like, oh, I can ride first class. Like, you just come up with all these things that you can do. And if, if that is, you know, one of the really big harms of very big companies is they just get really bloated. Mm -hmm. Well, if you never have tough times that force you to say, well, maybe we shouldn't always be flying first class, or maybe we didn't need to hire those 10 people, then you will forever be wasting money and you will never achieve full potential for your productivity. Whereas if you cycle through lean times and good times, in the lean times, you think very carefully about how to cut expenses, about how to have only the right staff who are doing the right things. And then when the money flows in, 
you give the people who are really valuable to the company raises and they get more productivity, or you think care, you've, you've thought really carefully about who is the next person you should hire to, to really maximize the leverage you have for your productivity and you hire the right people. Um, and if there's a bunch of software that you didn't need, you're not wasting money on it anymore. If there's some, you know, some executive who always wanted the fanciest things, you cut back on that a little bit. Um, and then when money does come in, you might be two, three, four, five times more productive because your operation is so efficient. And I think that's really the good analogy. It's better than the closet analogy for the human body because it's nice to have a nice closet, mm -hmm. but it's, it's critical to have an operational system that is efficient and productive, right? right? The yeah. efficiency and productivity of the human body determines its quality of sleep, its performance at a sport, its performance on the job, mm -hmm. it's the enjoyment it gets out of sex. Like everything that is valuable to you in being human depends on the operational efficiency of the human body. And so the reason fasting is important is it's not more important than being fed. Mm -hmm. It's just that most of us right now are far more likely to be more fed more of the time. Yeah. Right? And so what we're missing nowadays is incorporating the fasting cycle into that. We are in a constant state of abundance. We get bloated with inefficiency. And fasting is, that's imposing the lean times yeah. that, that increase operational efficiency um, so that when you are fed, that feeding goes into three, four, five times more productive use. But it's important not to get carried away about fasting because the purpose of fasting is to get fed really well. If you just fast and if you over obsess about fasting, you're going to cross some threshold at some point where you're just ripping things apart and you're not investing in them. Yeah, it's so true that uh, it's really important to go through periods of fasting, but also make sure that when you do eat, that uh, you get like high quality nutrients into yourself and feed well, so to say, because yeah. you know there's there's a potential danger that if you really jump on the bandwagon of fasting, then you fast too much and you may develop like some nutrient deficiencies if you don't get adequate nutri nutrients. So yeah, it's like uh, it's like fasting and feasting. That's like how our bodies evolved under, and uh, that's how we were most most likely thrive the best at as well. Yeah, and to put my Captain Obvious hat on uh, for a second. The end game of fasting is starving to death. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, you definitely need balance. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Uh, but yeah, I think it's been really awesome talking with you. Uh, we'll start wrapping the, this up as well. And uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, your, your cheat sheet uh, where you yeah. walk through these different nu nutrient deficiencies and how do you diagnose yourself and how do you fix them? So can you talk like briefly about it? Yeah, so, um, so the cheat sheet is, uh, is basically... Uh, I call it the ultimate testing nutritional status of the ultimate cheat sheet. It's called the cheat sheet because it's made to be as simple as possible to hold your hand through managing your nutritional status and give you as little reading to do as, as possible. Uh, but it's called the ultimate cheat sheet because it is 78 pages long, which is kind of long for a cheat sheet. And that's because it does give you the opportunity to read sections that give you your action plan and how to monitor the effectiveness of that action plan um, on an as-needed basis. So you could learn a lot from it if you read it cover to cover, but you don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a digital resource that serves, uh, it comes as, uh, as an iBook, a Kindle book, or uh, either a hyperlinked PDF or print-friendly PDF. You actually get all formats when you order it. And um, it basically walks you through the process of first deciding whether um, whether you have unlimited time and money to work on this or whether you're mostly limited by money or you're mostly limited by time. And depending on the resources available to you, it guides you through one of three approaches um, that put different emphasis on the different kinds of data we can collect. And if you have enough money, you do a comprehensive laboratory analysis. If money is limiting, you go back to laboratory analyses on an as needed basis when they would make a difference in a critical decision that you would make. So imagine that woman that we talked about before who, uh, who at one time in her life was anemic and another time in her life was iron overloaded. Well, that would be a case where doing the right testing would make the, would make the central difference in making opposite decisions, right? So it helps you 
if money is limiting, it helps you find out like, yes, in this case, spending a $60 is a very valuable use of my time. Um, but spending $2,000 on comprehensive uh, okay. analysis right out of the, right out of the gate is, is not a valuable use. And then it walks you through using either the lab testing, the dietary analysis or the signs and symptoms analysis and checklist uh, walks you through collecting that data, looking at what are the most probable nutrient deficiencies or toxicities or imbalances you need to work on, and then gives you an action plan to address that and a way to follow up to make sure that action plan is working. So mm -hmm. It's really a comprehensive hand-holding system for managing nutritional status. And uh, if people want to order it, it's $30. Put the link in your show notes to order it. And uh, I got a discount code that is in there for a 20% off discount for your audience. Yeah, yeah. I, I've gone through it and it's a really comprehensive and cuts cuts straight to the, uh, you know, I into the good stuff and uh, yeah. uh, doesn't doesn't have like a lot of the noise and it's really practical, no, no practical as well. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Uh, well, yeah, th great talking with you. Uh, before I ask my last question, uh, where can people learn more about you and your work? Yeah, so... Everything I do is at chrismasterjohnphd.com. And if people are on social media, I'm at chrismasterjohn, spelled just like my name. I'm mm -hmm. primarily on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. Every once in a while, I post something on Snapchat. <laughs> nice. Uh, my last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or a habit you wish you adopted sooner that improved your body and your mind? Ah, um... I have to say studying more psychology and psychological type. Mm. Um, so <laughs> I, I don't know if this applies to everyone. I think probably the best thing to apply to everyone is to really take some time out um, to shut off the usual patterns mm. and analyze what's, what's going on in your life. What are your goals? What just, you know, think more consciously about what you do. A lot of us operate on autopilot. Um, but I think that, uh, I think that right now I'm very interested in learning more about psychology to develop insights about how I can be a more effective and uh, better person. And I guess that's because, um, you know, I feel like I'm pretty good on nutrition. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm pretty good on exercise. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but I mean, you said sooner, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and so I just, I've learned a lot from studying, for example, my Myers-Briggs type about um, the primary way I use my own brain to do, for example, my nutrition work and about the things that are really missing from my primary functions that I could use to better leverage my primary skills. And I think, you know, learning about yourself, um, you can apply that to your work, but you can apply it to your emotional relationships. You can apply it to the habits around why you eat the way you do and why you might be falling short of your goals. And so I think studying yourself is, I guess it's, I guess those two are related, right? Like yeah. taking a little bit of time off to just reflect is a way of studying yourself. Yeah. Um, so yeah, study yourself and how you yeah. operate, understand yourself better. Yeah, I think uh, it was Socrates who said that the beginning of wisdom is is knowing thyself. <laughs> so mm. it's a good good one and really practical for like not only yourself but others as well. You, you begin to see uh, how others think and uh, what are, what 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 clicks. Yeah. Sort of saying. So it's even more powerful. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, great talking with you, and uh, we'll leave the link to the cheat sheet in the show notes for people to check out. And yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, looking forward to great. your future work. Thanks for having me. It was great. Yeah. All right, that's it for this episode of the Body, Mind and Format podcast. If you want to support us, then I would greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review on iTunes and the other social media platforms. You can now order my new book, Metabolic Autophagy, that covers a lot of the same topics that we talked in here. It's a collection of certain lifestyle habits and practices that prioritize longevity as well as performance. To support this podcast, you can also become a Patreon and get exclusive video lectures from my biohacking bootcamp that covers circadian rhythms, intermittent fasting, autophagy, resistance training, biofeedback, and many more. But other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.